Hello and welcome back to this Davenfield Idealistic Crusade. This video will be a review of Criterion's Spine number 1099 release on Blu-ray of one of the classic gems from the Warner Brothers Library, a film that is important for so many different reasons and one of the great masterpieces of the cinematic medium. That's of course 1940s absolute masterpiece directed by Raoul Walsh, written by W.R. Burnett and John Huston, based on W. Barnett's original novel, High Sierra. This is quite possibly Criterion's biggest catalog release of the year, uh, even in a year that featured Citizen Kane. That's how important this film is. And it's a film that has never quite gotten the, the accolades that it deserves. And it's a film that's important for uh, a lot of individuals that were involved in its production in terms of really establishing them, uh, chiefly among them John Huston and especially Humphrey Bogart most of all. This was the film that truly made Bogart more than any other. It's the first film that you have the iconic Bogart figure appear for the first time. Uh, you know, he exploded onto the scene in the Petrified Forest in 1936 and then went through many years of being gangster number two or number three or number four in Warner Brothers films, always coming second to the major leads, whether it be Paul Muni or James Cagney or Edward G. Robinson or even George Raft, and always getting killed in the next to last reel or um, occasionally being allowed to shine in, in some films like Black Legion, for example, which is a great Warner's film from the late 1930s, but he was kept on a significant leash in the studio contract system and was always dying to break out and do something that really could, you know, he could show his acting chops. And it wasn't until High Sierra, once everyone else basically had passed on it and uh, combined with John Huston writing the screenplay and they became friends and under the direction of Raoul Walsh, this is where Bogart the Legend first appears. Um, again, you can make the argument for other films, but I think it's it's unquestionably High Sierra that is the first Bogart film in, 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 in the terms that we think. I mean, he appears in the opening of the film, and that's it. You know, he's just there. He's it fully formed. Um, and it's also... As a film and its placement in, in 1940, 41, it is sort of the capstone at the end of the gangster film era. This is discussed some in the extras, but I think it's important to look at uh, the Roy Oral character and that, you know, he is released out of prison and he's one of the last remaining of the old gangsters, of the old way of doing things. And, um, but he has almost seemingly renounced that life. He wants nothing better to, than to pull this one last job uh, as, as a means of showing his loyalty to his old boss who's busted him out of prison uh, and then crash out and, and live his life and not have to live the old ways anymore. And in some ways, he has been reformed by his time in prison in society's eyes. But of course, uh, the entirety of the film, you feel the the forces of doom and the old life just hanging over everything. Uh, and in that sense, it is sort of a goodbye to the 1930s classic era of gangster films. And there weren't any more, really, in the, through the 1940s, because this was seeking into adapting hard-boiled detective fiction, and that eventually became film noir. That really, really takes off just after this film in The Maltese Falcon, which was John Huston's directorial debut and was the film that solidified Bogart as a screen legend. But all of that starts in High Sierra. Without High Sierra, there would have never been a Maltese Falcon directed by John Huston and starring Bogart. And that is why High Sierra's importance is only magnified. And it is a truly great film. But uh, those notions of it really birthing Bogart, uh, the icon, being sort of the last of the, the wave of major golden age gangster films. If we want to think of the 1930s as the golden age of gangster films, primarily at Warner Brothers, it's fitting that Raoul Walsh, who directed some of the greatest gangster films, ends it at Warner Brothers in 1941 with Humphrey Bogart, who had been killed in so many gangster films and had been in so many gangster films. Uh, and after this point, it's really only at the tail end of the 40s that you have the final nail in the coffin of gangster films, 
again directed by Raul Walsh and again with one of the iconic gangsters himself, James Cagney, and White Heat. So basically, at the start and the end of the 40s, you have the final bookends of, of the classic gangster films, which is High Sierra and then its polar opposite in White Heat uh, in 1949. And again, that is mentioned by some of the critics in the extras, but that's that's just something I've always thought about and in relation to this film and why I love it so much and why I think it's so important. So it was one of those mic drop surprises that Criterion does sometimes, and this was the title along with you know Citizen Kane this year that just made me run for the hills and you know, as soon as as soon as I get my hands on this and pour over every last extra and every last frame, um, you know this th- there was no way i was i was not getting this release so again this is by number 1099 and they've commissioned this lovely new artwork which is very striking showing off the uh high sierra location and i love that it's in black and white and that carries over onto the rear which has a sort of mixture of fonts that uh, both look like um, handwritten font and typewritten font which i thought was a nice touch of course there is the spine. And this is a two disc affair. So that is why we've got the uh, tiered case and then the lovely booklet also keeping everything in black and white. And I love that the two leads of Bogart and Ida Lupino are reunited on the booklet when you open it fully with everyone's favorite, Pard the Dog. Now, to go into the restoration uh, of the film, which was primarily handled by Warner Brothers, so I had assumed this would hopefully be a Warner Archive release at some point, but I guess Criterion decided to pick it up and produce this beautiful extras package. But I'll read you the uh, restoration blurb that's included. So, uh, High Sierra is presented in the original ratio of 137 to 1, the new 4K restoration was undertaken by Criterion. The film was originally released at 100 minutes in 1940 and cut down to 95 minutes for a 1948 reissue. Uh, no original negative survives for either version. Uh, the complete original 100-minute version is presented here, uh, created from a fine-grained master positive from the Museum of Modern Art. And then, due to damage, some scenes were replaced using a nitrate fine grain of the shorter version. Uh, scanning of both elements was done in 4K on a laser graphics director film scanner at eFilm. And then the original mono mix was remastered from the 35mm original soundtrack negative of the shorter version, which is stored at the Library of Congress, and also a positive track sourced from the Museum of Modern Art's fine grain print, so one of the prints used in the restoration. Uh, both audio transfers were performed at Deluxe and Burbank. So that gets you at least a little idea that this is not going to be a hyper pristine restoration as if it was working from original camera negative sources so do keep that in mind uh the film has had a pretty good video release history but it's never had a a very you know sparkling crystal clear version available because apparently the negative is long gone I do think that uh, the primary source is what they had used on the previous releases because if you go back to the DVD or the Laserdisc, they are using uh, what looks like the same source because it has some of the same marks and unfortunately some of the same hairs have made it over. Um, there, there are two spots that if you're uh, very uh, eagle-eyed, you will spot. Um, the first one, they're, they're very small and it only lasts for you know maybe 20 seconds or so. But there's, there's one particularly larger one that sticks up towards the climax of the film when uh, Roy is backing his car up at one point, uh, and that has been in every version I've ever seen. So I guess that's because it's baked in to um, that, uh, I guess, the fine grain uh, print that, that they used partially for this restoration as well. Um, that's in the previous versions. Um, but I will say, I've never seen the film look this good. Uh, I think mixing in that other print element and using modern techniques in a 4K scan really resulted in a, uh, a much more nuanced image than I'm used to with High Sierra. And of course, I've seen this film dozens, if not hundreds of times. Uh, it is a beautiful looking Blu-ray, but do keep in mind that they're not working from camera negative sources and it is already using two different film sources 
uh, to patch together and to patch in to to use that nitrate print to patch into the fine grain essentially. So you are going to notice some fluctuations and some different densities and things, but nothing's ever obtrusive or or, or noticeable. And if you know this film, if you've seen it before, uh, you'll immediately be struck at how impressive it looks and how much more again nuance and range you'll you'll make uh, make out in the image. Again, the the biggest thing is the is the two instances of hairs in the cake. That's that's my that's that's my 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 quibble is is there's there's a particularly large hair in one shot, um, and it's not it's not huge or anything, but that's that's just the level that I'm having to go to to even find anything to to um, to point out because this is a beautiful looking disc and it's amazing how good it looks considering the materials they had to work from. Now, jumping over to the audio side of things, it's just as impressive. Uh, it's actually more impressive in terms of the audio. I've not seen anybody really comment on this, but uh, doing my usual sort of uh, detective work and digging around, I, of course, looked at my older copies. Um, and again, that that hair I was talking about in the gate is still there on, on those as well. Um, but looking at my older copies... Um, the the laser disc, which is only here in the Bogart collection box set with three other films with a PCO mono soundtrack, it sounds uh, quite a bit muffled actually. Um, it doesn't have the sparkly high end that's on this release, and the DVD was a little bit better than the laser disc, but almost sounds kind of pinched. Um, so it is a significant night and day comparison difference when you look at the older versions compared to this new release. This is by far and away the best sounding audio presentation of the film I think that exists, period. Um, in fact, I think the audio improvement is perhaps even more impressive than the picture improvement, which is already superb. So this is a release I can heartily recommend in both picture and sound especially as being better than any other version that I'm aware of, including the old DVD and the uh, Laserdisc and the Bogart box set. So that was a really pleasant surprise because I can only say that in certain instances. Uh, when I get releases like this of classic films that I know and love and I have older releases of, you really do have to bring audio tracks and 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 look at them and really look at them with a fine tooth comb and it really isn't until that you bring them into say audacity and you're looking at the waveforms that uh, you can really tell the difference because you have it there right in front of you, you can easily jump back and forth but even just having um, all the discs playing at the same time, and if you were toggling between, say, the Laserdisc or the DVD and the Blu-ray, the difference is noticeable uh, to to the naked ear. You know, if you're just sitting there and you had the DVD in a player and you had the, the new Criterion release playing at the same time and you had just, you know, the two different inputs on your receiver, you will notice the difference. There is a beautiful amount of high end on this release. There's there's nice hiss. Uh, it's never overwhelming, but it's hiss that's not really present on the older releases. So there's fine detail here that is not available on the older releases. So uh, please do pick this up simply for the audio alone. This is one of the best sounding discs of 2021 and is a night and day improvement over all previous releases. So again, the audio is just as in fact, I think it's more impressive than the picture restoration, which again is already superb. So that was a really beautiful discovery. I was so pleased at that because it doesn't always happen. Even on Warner Brothers titles, it doesn't always happen when Criterion puts out a release that the audio is better than the older releases. In fact, it's usually the opposite. On, on most labels releases, the audio track they're supplied with is actually inferior or over cleaned and sounds worse than the older releases will hear. It's the exact opposite. So that was a beautiful surprise. But that, of course, is not all we had to discuss because since this is a two-disc affair, um, that is what makes this package so wonderful and important because Criterion has included the second version of the film's story, which was 1949's Colorado Territory, again directed by Raoul Walsh and transposing the film's story into the West. So it has been described as a Western remake of High Sierra, it is. I mean, there's there's no getting around that. It is the same basic framework and story. 
but it's very surprising and very invigorating the changes they do make and and the, how they play around with the characters and they change some of the um, some characters' moralities and things play out differently. So it's not just you know um, switching from Bogart to the always forever underrated Joel McRae on a horse and telling the same story. No, it is a completely different film that just happens to have the same story framework, but it plays out completely different. And you go from Ida Lupino's uh, legendary performance as Marie to Virginia Mayo in what is quite possibly her best screen performance. I, I was blown away. I hadn't seen the film in a while, and I'd forgotten just how amazingly good she is in Colorado Territory as Colorado. Uh, but um, Colorado Territory is a film that doesn't get discussed very much. It's the second of three versions of High Sierra. The third was made in the mid-1950s, again by Warner Brothers, as under the title I Died a Thousand Times, with Jack Palance and Shelley Winters, and basically goes back to the High Sierra script. So that one is a direct remake of High Sierra. That makes Colorado Territory a bit different, because you have the same director returning at the end of the decade. It's also in black and white, but it's a Western. And it is very much a different film. You can watch both films back to back and get a different experience. Some do prefer Colorado Territory over High Sierra. I don't because I think Colorado Territory, it, it moves faster. It's a little bit shorter uh, in terms of the runtime and the pace is, is a bit quicker. Um, so I, I do miss some of the, the quieter moments in High Sierra, but there's still quite moments in Colorado Territory. And I was uh, I was blown away at how much how much mileage they got out of just certain small changes and certain tweaks to different characters and then transposing it all into a Western setting. Uh, it's a beautiful film, and so it was a wonderful surprise. Criterion included it uh, on the second disc of this release. I do wish, though, um, it just says, you know, High Sierra Disc 2. I wish it said Colorado Territory on the disc label. When you put the disc in, it says Colorado Territory on the menu. So, that, I mean, that's just a, a minor quibble, but that's something that I, I would have liked to have seen. And, of course, on the cover, it's just High Sierra, so it's not like it's advertising. It's a dual feature release. So this is very much like what Criterion has done with, say, um, His Girl Friday, including the original version of the front page, for example, or um, when they released Holiday, it included the uh, older version of the film. So it had two versions of the film. So they've done that again here with High Sierra. But th with with this, it's really important because Col Ter Colorado Territory is a great film in its own right. Um, but, I mean, I don't think it's as good as High Sierra, but I still love it, and I was so swept up into it because what Criterion did was they went and scanned the original negative at the Library of Congress. So it is a beautiful presentation. Unfortunately, this it was not subjected to a full restoration like High Sierra was, and there is a disclaimer at the beginning of it. So you will see scratches and marks and things like that, um, but that they're not obtrusive at all. It looks it's a beautiful presentation that uh, doesn't look much unlike what you'd see of uh, seeing a print screening at uh, your local art house theater. Uh, if if you if you were looking at somehow a, a very um, a low generation copy of Colorado Territory, the only problem I had with the transfer is that it it looks so great that you wish that they'd taken the time to just go ahead and and, and restore it. I wouldn't have minded paying a little bit more because it's so beautiful looking that the, the the minor problems are just like oh man what if what if this had you know gotten cleaned up uh, the worst part i'd say the only objectionable part to the transfer which itself is is beautiful the transfer is beautifully done um and i'm not saying that it's you know unrestored you know obviously it's been stabilized and uh you know there isn't any uh light fluctuation um but there are two spots where there are brief moments of missing frames. So there are two very brief spots where um, the screen goes black. It's, it's very brief. It's, it's, you may not even notice that there are little, little small flashes. But um, there are those and there are one or two spots where the image gets really deteriorated, almost like it's a, a real change. But, of course, this was supposedly a negative scan. Um, so I do wish that um, they had maybe located another print or seen what Warner Brothers had on hand uh, to maybe, um, you know, 
use a secondary print source to keep the the two spots from having missing frames but again i don't know what was available and they obviously didn't have the budget to perform a full restoration which i understand um but the transfer is so beautiful the source is so beautiful that you just wish it could have been fully restored because boy is it stunning so you're basically getting that for free tacked on to high sierra in terms of that is the primary extra and it is gorgeous but that's only the beginning of the supplement section which is actually uh, one of the more substantial ones of a criterion release in the recent past in addition to the fact that it includes the entire feature film colorado territory so that, of course, leads off the extras, which continues. The first of these is another in this uh, style of Criterion uh, extra that they've been doing a number of years now, where uh, two notable film critics sit down and talk about the film and its director, writer, and stars in particular, and how this film uh, impacted their careers and its own particular strengths and how it's been for them over the years, how their personal reactions were, uh, both in the initial reaction after seeing the film for the first time and in the years since. So we have another of these um, critical discourses uh, with this time with Dave Kerr and uh, Farron Sarah Neem. And it's a really nice, I, I really love these, these sit downs that they do. And of course, they're just obviously in a room talking to each other about High Sierra and Raoul Walsh and uh, this film and its place in Bogart's career and so on and so forth. But it's, it's a really nice, rather lengthy conversation, and it's like you're getting to sit in on it. And it's just uh, two critics talking about the film and its greatness. And I love these more informal, looser discussions that Criterion has been doing more of uh, in this particular style. So after that, the other major draw, and this, this is as every bit as good as I hoped it would be, uh, but this actually includes a feature-length documentary uh, entitled The True Adventures of Raoul Walsh. It's produced in 2019 by Marilyn Ann Moss, who wrote a really great book on Raoul Walsh. So uh, I haven't gotten to read the, the entirety of the book yet, but I've read the reviews, and it's been on my wish list for ages. So I guess this was like a, a fantastic teaser for that book. But it is, a again, a feature-length documentary about Raoul Walsh's life and how he entered motion pictures very early in the silent era and became one of the great legendary directors of all time. Uh, I think without question, Raoul Walsh is one of the legends in the pantheon of great directors and great cinematic artists and does not get the credit he deserved. He, 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 he doesn't get the name recognition uh, as, as some of his contemporaries do, such as John Ford. Uh, and in a great many ways, I think this is because he has a very unpretentious manner of working and uh, his films don't carry all of the uh, typical signatures of things that got very much swept up into the auteur theory in the 50s and 60s. So Walsh never had that that sort of cachet that other names did. And uh, at his best, when the material is there, he's every bit as good. I mean, he is one of the legends. And he lasted from the silent era into the 1960s uh, in terms of, of directing films. And also he was an actor too. So I think that's why uh, so many great screen legends uh, fared so well under his direction because he had it not been for the infamous incident of a jackrabbit through a windshield on a film shoot, uh, necessitating the uh, famous black patch over one eye that Walsh became known for, his acting career would have continued and possibly uh, his directing career wouldn't have taken off in the way that it uh, was uh, became necessary to do so. But I think that in uh, every film that he directed, he, of course, knew what went through actors' minds, having been an actor himself. And so I think he was able to get certain performances out of actors that uh, maybe they didn't even know that they had in them. Uh, most notably, Bogart and High Sierra, along with Ida Lupino. Uh, he made several films with both. And, uh, of course, also he became essentially the the uh, the co-conspirator and sort of uh, director champion of Errol Flynn at Warner Brothers after Flynn refused to work with Michael Curtiz anymore. 
uh, and he directed some of Flynn's best performances, uh, along with many, many, many others. But it's a wonderful documentary. It is chock full of direct source quotes. So you're hearing Walsh in his own words. And it's just one of those documentaries you fall into. You you just it's before you know it, it's been 90 minutes. So again, it is a full feature length documentary. It is loaded with clips from Walsh's films, and it does have some talking heads, like you'll see um, Alan K. Road and uh, Leonard Maltin pop up here and there. But it's not a documentary that is front loaded with talking heads and film clips. It is primarily uh, hardcore facts and information and direct first person material from Walsh himself, his own memories and his own in his own words so while there are a lot of film clips it's it's not the majority of the documentary like uh, unfortunately most are so i was beyond thrilled with this because um i hope people get this release and they watch this documentary because i think most people aren't aware of just how far ranging and how important uh, walsh's career was because it's just massive the amount of films that he worked on as both actor and director and how many uh famous names were his contemporaries and uh, just how long his career lasted and how many great films that he made uh so that was a wonderful documentary so i do highly recommend that and it again it goes goes by like that it is it is a feature link documentary that you wish was twice as long it's that good so that is the primary uh feature of the extra since it is at feature length but is it all uh they port the curtains for roy earl a little documentary from the original warner brothers dvd release and that is i mean it's it's a little cheesy here and there but it's a it's a perfect distillation of the film's production history and its effects on uh, both the careers of Humphrey Bogart and John Huston in the immediate aftermath, uh, but distilled down to like, you know, 12 to 15 minutes. So it is the same featurette from the DVD, but it was really well done, even if it is a bit concise. Uh, but that's a perfect distillation of the film's production in about 15 minutes. So that was nice that they ported that over. Then there is a 1997 uh, documentary from the South Bank Show, so it's a British documentary from television uh, entitled Bogart, Here's Looking at You, Kid, and it is basically a, uh, a British television documentary on Bogart's life and career, but what makes it extra special is that they got the involvement of his son, Stephen Humphrey Bogart, who had also at the, around the same time wrote a personal memoir uh, entitled In Search of My Father, so you get these great little bits where Stephen Stephen Bogart is digging into archives and looking at uh, photographic materials and old newspaper clippings and talking to people who knew his dad and doing all this on camera uh, when he was himself trying to learn more about his father and having to primarily rely on the cinematic legacy and everything tied into the production of the film since uh, when Bogart died in 1957. Uh, Stephen himself was extremely young, so he never really got to know his father beyond uh, his early childhood years. So that's what makes it uh, a, a special documentary, and I'm really glad it was included here. I'd seen it before somewhere. I can't remember where, but um, what makes it special is that particular aspect of it. And it does give you a good overview if you're not too familiar with Humphrey Bogart's rise to uh, motion picture stardom and his career uh, before, during, and after Warner Brothers. So it, it's a good summary of Bogart's career, but uh, it's really special for um, the participation of his son. So that was that was a nice touch, their inclusion of that. Uh, then there is a new interview piece with the critic uh, Miriam J. Petty about uh, Willie Best, who uh, appears in the film. And this is a particular point that I've, I've noticed in person because I have shown High Sierra to people a number of times, both in film societies that I've run and uh, any time talking about Bogart, I have to bring up High Sierra because it's that important. And um, every, especially nowadays, everybody always notice the notices the character of Algernon who uh, works at the... Um, the, uh, the the retreat away in the High Sierras that uh, the gang holds up at and plans the heist of the film. And he is a comic relief character and played by the actor Willie Best. So it is 
obviously uh, designed uh, as many roles for black actors were at the time as a caricature and uh, unfortunately a, a bit of a racist stereotype. But I, it, it's something that every time that uh, it gets brought up now, it seems a lot of people put maybe a bit too much focus on it because it's not a major character in the film and it's not anything that's you know as horrible as it could be with those types of characters even in this era in the early 1940s but I am glad they took the time to make an extra and actually talk about best career and really highlight how difficult it was for black actors to uh, if they could get any work at all uh, they had to take what they got and unfortunately it was almost always demeaning stereotypes or things that were uh, based around uh, pre-established comedy acts. And so in the best case scenarios, you had certain actors and performers who were actually able to incorporate some of their vaudeville materials. So material themselves, they had developed themselves, but things that were designed for black audiences. So I really appreciated the level of detail this extra went into because I, I know I'm aware of, of these factors, but I know a lot of people may not necessarily be aware of just how difficult it was for black actors and actresses at this time period to um, not only get work, but then when they got work and they were confronted with roles like this, how they had to um, struggle to cope and deal with it and also get uh, some sort of paycheck. So it was um, uh, unfortunately a, a double-edged sword and... You know, thankfully those things no longer exist, but I am glad instead of just, you know, saying this is something that shouldn't have happened, actually they took the time to uh, dedicate a whole extra to Willie Best, the actor, his career, and sort of giving an idea of the condition of black actors in Hollywood at that time period in the early 1940s to give people more of that necessary historical context for how simply films were made at the time. So I, I really appreciated the level of detail this went into because unfortunately nowadays when you bring up High Sierra, the, the Algernon character is one of the first things people point out or bring up even if they haven't seen the film. And again, it is by far a, a, a very minor character who's only in the film for a couple minutes uh, combined most of all and it is very much nothing like the the levels of r racist caricature that could exist in films in the 30s and 40s so um, I, I am glad that it was uh, focused on uh, it also it's also touched on in the in the booklet essay but I'm really glad that the extra actually took the time to go into the historical context of of what black actors had to deal with in Hollywood at the time. So that makes it really rewarding, and I think that'll be really helpful for anybody who is seeing High Sierra for the first time, and that may stick out to them, and if they want to know more, now they can and get that necessary historical context for simply how things were unfortunately done at the time. So uh, outside of that, then the extras continue, with a really fascinating, it's called a video essay, but uh, it's basically, it's hard to describe, but it's wonderfully done. It's where they basically uh, have a caricature in a cartoon form of the uh, people as they're talking. It's an interview session with uh, W.R. Burnett, the writer of the original novel, who also gets co-screenwriter credit with uh, John Huston on the film and talking uh, in a old 1976 uh, AFI interview, uh, just talking about his work and, and how he went from writing Little Caesar originally and eventually writing what became the novel basis for High Sierra and its adaption process, and also his own working methods in terms of how he uh, writes differently for novels versus if he's writing a screenplay, and his own sort of um, mental attitude in terms of writing. It's a fascinating piece because I don't know if I'd ever heard W.R. Burnett actually talking before. Uh, his, his 
fictional work is so vastly important to the foundations of the gangster and crime genres. Again, this is the same man who wrote Little Caesar, which became really the first major sound gangster film that blew the doors open and firmly established the genre. Uh, it was the one-two punch of Little Caesar, followed by, very quickly, The Public Enemy, and then Scarface in 1932, that formed the sort of holy trinity of the original talky gangster films. But it's a fascinating piece to hear him talk in his own words, and then you get this wonderful video cartoon caricature rendering of, of the two men talking in the interview or Burnett at, at his typewriter and things like that. So that was just fascinating. Then they also nice, very nicely included the radio adaptation of High Sierra from 1944 that actually brings back both Bogart and Ida Lupino. Uh, it's actually in rather nice quality. A lot of times when these radio dramas get carried over, the audio quality can leave something to be desired. Uh, of course, simply because of the source material, but this one sounds really, really nice. And of course, it's basically the film condensed down to about an hour, but it's always interesting to hear when it's the original stars able to return and reprise the roles, this being, you know, three, four years down the road. But also uh, the changes made to condense the, the film down to an hour. It's interesting to look at from a structure, structure perspective, and it also compresses the action down. So, of course, even the same actors, they do wind up performing certain scenes a little bit differently. So I think it's a really fascinating listen to hear uh, Bogart and Lupino a couple years later come back and do some of the same scenes, but it's a little bit different. Just like when you look at Colorado Territory, it's the same basic story, but a lot of little things are just a little bit different. That makes it a different feel. So that's a really nice inclusion. And again, the sound quality is really nice, so you can listen to it and not have any problems uh, with the garbled audio or anything. Uh, it also includes trailers for High Sierra and Colorado Territory, which was a nice touch because a lot of times when uh, bonus features are included, they either don't have or don't include the trailer for the second film. Of course, subtitles and the essay is by Imogen Sarah Smith, which is a nice essay, of course, as I showed earlier in the booklet, titled Crash Out, which is the key uh, idea central to Roy Earl in the film and basically the whole film's meaning in that one term. So that rounds out the extras package. And again, this is uh, one of the most stuffed uh, in terms of uh, extras uh, releases Criterion has done some time. In addition to having an entire second feature, you technically have three with the inclusion of the Raul Walsh documentary. So you basically have three features in this release if you include the documentary plus the other extras and the essay. I am absolutely over the moon with this release. I think this is uh, one of Criterion's releases of the year. It is quite possibly their best release of the year, in my opinion. It is a uh, an absolutely incredible, flawless presentation with audio improvements that uh, elevate this far beyond earlier releases. And they included the feature-length documentary on Raoul Walsh, one of the great, underrated, undervalued master directors who does not ever get the credit that he is so richly deserves as being one of the great cinematic artists. But it also includes the 1949 Colorado Territory, which is a hugely underrated film. Uh, I had seen it years and years ago, and I had forgotten just how effective it was. And again, it's the same core story, but it's amazing to see the little differences and the differences in tone that Walsh brings to it, basically at the, uh, you know, basically about 10 years after the fact. Uh, in fact, it was Walsh himself who instigated remaking the film as a Western. Uh, he felt it had that potential, and he was absolutely right. It's a fantastic film. Uh, it just the only thing that hurts it is that you have to hold it up against such a landmark uh, cinematic treasure as High Sierra. So it is easily one of the best Criterion packages of the year. In fact, I think this is one of the best Blu-rays Criterion has ever released. I think this is a flawless disc. Uh, if I have not convinced you by now, I have done a bad job. Uh, it, it's also one of the beautiful Criterion packages that gives you two actually three feature length presentations for the price of one without having to buy a box set or anything and it's a beautiful restoration of one of the key icons of warner brothers library and again 
this is the film where Bogart the legend was formalized. Uh, his performance as Roy Earl is the first time you see him throw off the shackles of being stuck as as the B-film actor or being cast as the second or third or fourth lead and really present this multifaceted, complex puzzle of a man who really, in a lot of ways, I think the film really prefaces what would eventually become the revisionist western that's why i think walsh was so right to think this story would make a great western because watching it this time i was struck at just how many themes of high sierra are so reminiscent of the revisionist western that would emerge in the mid to late 50s and the 60s and onwards Especially, uh, it has a great amount of the same themes that would turn up frequently in Sam Peckinpah's films. So I, I, I've always gotten the feeling that High Sierra must have been a, a favorite film of Peckinpah's because it just seems to have him written all over it in terms of its thematics. But Bogart is matched by Ida Lupino, who is just incredible as, as Marie. I think it's it's probably my favorite performance of hers. And the, the, the fact that the... The, the romance between the two characters is not immediately thrown out there and it's only alluded to or maybe suggested here and there uh, makes it feel all the more uh, three-dimensional and realistic and honest uh, th that gets compounded by by Roy's apparent fixation on the very uh, beautific almost angelic Joan Leslie character that he encounters uh, on the road uh, and and why he's so fixated on her is is that she is perhaps the the symbol of all the good things that he possibly could have been in life and so she's like the physical embodiment of of the the life he's he's now aspiring to and wants to get away from the old life and and uh, that's why he stops and visits his old childhood farm and why he feels like he's been granted a new lease on life when he's let out of prison but of course none of that is for him and he should have known that from the start and deep down he really did but he just didn't want to want to admit it to himself and that is another just deeply felt layer in the Bogart characterization in the film and something that I think John Huston was getting at in his screenplay and it's it's important not to overlook Huston's contribution and this being not just the breakout film for Bogart and his career at Warner Brothers but also the breakout film for John Huston uh, who had been working as a screenwriter for a number of years and this being a major attempt for both to achieve a, a new step up the rungs of the ladder in the studio system. And it is the success of this film under Raoul Walsh that set up everything that came afterwards. Without High Sierra, there would be no Maltese Falcon. Without no Maltese Falcon, there would be no Bogart. There would be no John Huston. And it's th this this idea is set up further by the fact that Bogart is not even top billed in the film that really made him famous. Ida Lupino was top billed. Uh, this film comes off the heels of the Raoul Walsh directed 1940 classic Warner Brothers film They Drive by Night where uh, Bogart had the second lead again to George Raft, who actually was offered and turned down High Sierra, one of the many times he turned down films that made Bogart's career. But Ida Lupino had a really standout role where she has a huge emotional meltdown at the end of the film, which is a fantastic scene. And audiences remembered that, so they decided to give her top billing in High Sierra. So it's a bit jarring when you come to this film the first time and you see the credits, and you always forget that Bogart doesn't have the the top billing in High Sierra. That, of course, would change after this, but this this is the film that solidifies the Bogart persona and there's a there's a, a wonderful poetic quality to the film that I think was really cemented by John Huston so I think you get his uh, sensibilities all throughout and all of this was picked up on by Walsh who really just hammered it home and in the film that is really the capstone of the end of of the classic era of gangster films of the 1930s. So High Sierra is important for so many different reasons, and it's still a film that gets to you emotionally. I mean, I, I, I still am genuinely affected every time I get to the end of this film. I, it's one of the 
beautiful treasures of the Warner Brothers library. It's one of the great American films. Uh, it's one of the great cinematic treasures. Uh, I mean, I, I, I never get tired of this film. I, I just, I think it is so unbelievably important, but it doesn't get mentioned as much as the more iconic Bogart titles, you know, because you have the Maltese Falcon and Casablanca and the African Queen and Treasure of the Sierra Madre, among many, many others, it kind of gets overshadowed, if, if I'm honest, and it is right there with them. It is one of the great films, period. And Criterion has done it justice in Spine 1099. This is one of the best releases of 2021, and one of, simply put, one of the best Blu-rays Criterion has ever produced. This is a beautiful package, and it comes complete with two additional features in the great fantastic 1949 western colorado territory and the beautiful feature-length documentary on the legend raul walsh so please do yourself a favor if you haven't gotten this already please get the criterion collection blu-ray of high sierra spine 1099 one of the best blu-rays the company has ever produced and then after you've seen the film or come to the film again after many viewings before the criterion release then perhaps you can crash out and Pard will be there. Only you might want to keep an eye on him. He's supposed to be a bit of a bad luck charm. 